Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy New Year. Welcome in to this week's episode of the Don't Tell Mama Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Kobold. Joining me today, also in Denver, Colorado, my guy, Samson Belkus. Sam, big week for you and fantasy, man. Championship game of our league. How you feeling? Well, in one sense, I feel fantastic. In another sense, I'm sick with anxiety about who to start, who to sit. Um, these are the struggles that you have when you are on the precipice of being elite champion, Matt. <laughs> I, uh, I'd love to get into those lineup decisions a little bit later when we're talking some NFL broski. But uh, first, I want to hear from you. Right now, we're sitting here Friday night, TGIF. Usually, this pod's on Wednesdays. We, we moved it to Friday this week. Max is up north with his family. Merry Christmas, Max. Hope you check out the pod. But we're here right now, Friday on December 29th. Sam, tell me what you got into on Christmas. Thank God it's Friday, Matt. Yeah, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to everybody. Um, Christmas was great. We were out of town for Thanksgiving. Uh, we didn't have a ton of time off for Christmas. So uh, my girlfriend, Roxanne, and I, we just kicked it at our place. Um, we had Christmas Eve dinner with you guys and another couple. That was that was nice. And Christmas morning, we had a slow morning. We FaceTime all our different family members. And uh, we maybe started a new tradition of making homemade cinnamon rolls. That oh. turned out pretty good. So it was a great, relaxing holiday weekend. What'd you guys get into? Those cinnamon rolls sound good. Uh, you mentioned that Christmas Eve dinner we had. That was good. That ham. I tell you what, they Matt and Ali Vukas, they sent me home with some ham. I ate it. So I ate it four days in a row then. That bit that was still good, still juicy. But damn it, Sam, you really made you you were really something that night. First, you spill somebody's drink at the dinner table. Okay. You get sloppy at the dinner table. Then you go into the kitchen about an hour later, maybe. Excuse me. You drop the whole plate of cookies. The dog grabs one, almost chokes on it. You Sam, you were really something. D damn embarrassing night for you. Did you apologize? First time over at the house. Matt, you are a great storyteller, and you have a knack for over-exaggeration. I did spill some cookies. I don't know about spilling a drink. I don't know about that. Knocked the, knocked the cup right off the dinner table. Must not even remember. It was a sippy cup, so it oh. had a lid on it. So literally nothing spilled from it. Okay, I'll give you the cookies. There was a tray of cookies I was trying to help clean up after the dinner was over. Oh. And I dropped a few of them, and I snagged them so fast, but that dog was quicker. And it did eat one, but... It didn't have any chocolate in it. I think the dog's just fine. So you better hope party foul fine. on me, I guess, but whatever. First time over the house. We'll see if you get an invite back next year. <laughs> but uh, on Christmas Day, I started, a, you want to talk about Christmas traditions. I started a tradition a couple of years ago. Uh, for those that don't know, Kelly, my wife, is a, was a travel nurse, as you were too, Sam. That's how, that's how I met you because you started travel nursing. But uh, usually she worked on Christmas these last few years. So that that gave me the opportunity to have a lot of free time on Christmas. So I took to hiking. I started a tradition a couple of years ago to hike on Christmas. And today I went to the Flatirons in Boulder, home of the Buffaloes. You know, you can actually see campus from a couple of different spots along the trail. And uh, you had to remind me, Sam, before we got on here, that you actually did the flat irons with us a couple of years ago. What what would what do you think about that hike if you can remember? Boulder's gorgeous, and the flat irons are super cool. I've hiked the flat irons two or three times now, especially since living here. Um, it's a great hike, great views, um, and yeah, you and I had a good time. It was one of the first things we did together when we were both here back in 2020. So. Yeah, I love the flat irons. It's one of those hikes that you'll just go back to and do time and time again. Never gets old. Yeah, you, there's a there's different trails that you can take, different paths to go to go down, and there's a little bit of scrambling in some areas. And yeah, there's a lot of snow. There's a lot of snow for for this one, so that was fun. I, I had my spikes on. Definitely got got my, some spikes from Matt Bukas on Christmas Eve. But uh, yeah, definitely beautiful when you're up there on the flat irons. It was it was great. It was. 
it was actually easier than I remembered it. So it, it really was breezed, breezed right through. Would would love to go back with you again and do that sometime, Sam. Definitely. It's a very different tradition you got, but I like it. So did Kelly work on Christmas then? Yeah. So she actually had to work night shift, which is, isn't something that, that she's done in a while. So, you know, we got up early, uh, Alec, Megan, and the kids, they spent the night, got up about 6 15 6 30 for those presents you know santa santa came and presents were, were ready to get ripped open early so she she went to bed about noon to to sleep before her night shift so that that's when i took off definitely had the had the whole day ahead of me gotcha but this week on the don't tell mama sports podcast we're not going to be hitting any college basketball okay i know we've been we've been talking a lot of college ball lately but it's a dead point, dead point in the season, you know, Christmas break, finals, students are off campus, not a lot of big matchups, but conference play is starting. Conference play is starting going into this weekend, so get ready for that. This week, we're going to talk about the NFL like we do. We're going to get back into some game picks. We're going to do our extra juicy dogs at the end, but we're going to start with the college football playoff because, baby, that's on Monday, Sam. I can't believe we finally made it Monday. First game, 3 o'clock Mountain Time on ESPN. The Rose Bowl in Pasadena, California. We got the top-ranked undefeated Michigan Wolverines taking on the number four-ranked Alabama Crimson Tide. Sammy Boy, let's start with Michigan here. Like I said, they're undefeated. They have a 32nd-ranked strength of schedule. They average 36.7 points per game. That's 14th in the nation. They allow 9.5 points per game. Guess what? That leads the nation. First in the nation in points per game allowed, 9.5. Senior running back Blake Corum ran all over. Another 1,000-yard season for him, and he led the nation with 24 rushing touchdowns. Senior wide receiver Roman Wilson led the Wolverines from a receiving uh, perception. 662 yards and 11 touchdowns. That was top 10 in the nation. They also had two more guys that had over 560 receiving yards, sophomore tight end Colston Loveland and senior wide receiver Cornelius Johnson. Three guys over 560 receiving yards. J.J. McCarthy, he's 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 spreading it around. 74.2% completion percentage for J.J. this season. 2,630 yards, 19 to 4 touchdown to interception ratio. Three more touchdowns on the ground. Sam, let's start this Michigan discussion with can J.J. McCarthy lead an undefeated season for the Wolverines? Yeah, this first one's a juicy one. Both games are juicy. Um, can't wait. So excited. Um, yeah, Michigan. Definitely the most polarizing team in in the bunch with the, you know, the firing of the head coach and, and all that controversy. Um, but you can't punish the kids, you know, like, you gotta let the you gotta let the kids play. I, I definitely think they belong. They've had a really strong season, and uh, the last couple of years, the Michigan Wolverines are no stranger to the college football playoffs. Yep. Um, and it's for that reason that I think that they might be able to get it done. But man, that's a tall order against Alabama. You want to talk about no stranger to the college football playoffs? That's Alabama. I mean, since Nick Saban has been there. In the early 2000s, their success, I mean, is unrivaled. I mean, you might mention Georgia, but it's seriously, no one compares when you look at all their national championships. Um, but this Michigan Wolverines team is exciting. Do I think J.J. McCarthy can get in there? Not by himself. I think with Michigan, it's it's the it's very much a the, – the whole team's got to be firing on all cylinders. I don't think he's the kind of – put the team on my back quarterback that's going to do it for them. But if they get big time contributions from all their stars, as well as their defense, I, I do think it's possible. Um, yeah. They've been exciting all year. It's going to be a great game. 24 rushing touchdowns for Blake Corum this year. My goodness. I, I think we're going to be seeing him on Sundays. Let's talk about Alabama here. They have a fifth ranked strength of schedule sec. You know, that's, that's the, that's the big dog. They averaged almost 35 points per game. That was 18th in the nation. They gave up 18 and a half points per game. That was second in the SEC, 17th nationally. Quarterback, sophomore Jalen Milrow, sophomore. Let me say that again. 2,718 yards, 23 to 6 touchdown interception ratio. 
added 468 rushing yards and 12 touchdowns on the ground. Pretty solid, solid season for Jalen. Alabama, they got two seniors in the backfield, Jace McClellan and Roydell Williams. They combined for over 1,350 yards and 11 rushing scores. The wideouts were led by senior Jermaine Burton. He had 777 yards and eight touchdowns on 22.2 yards per reception. Big play threat there, Jermaine Burton. Let's also not sleep on sophomore Isaiah Bond. He had 621 receiving yards and four touchdowns himself. Sam, you bring up the history of Alabama in these in these playoffs, the college football playoff, first one in 2014. Alabama has the most appearances and the most wins. Give me what you got on Alabama and then lead me into a game pick here. There's a lot of different avenues you can go. Like which which player, which side of the ball, like what what it will look like on game day for Alabama to take this one over Michigan. For me, I think when you get into meaningful football, whether that's college, professional, or Pop Warner, it's about the things that everybody knows about. Offensive and defensive line, running the ball, and just a really strong defense. And so I think if we see a big game from that tandem of senior running backs, I think we'll see – Alabama advancing to the national championship senior leadership and usually Alabama has one guy that does it for him it's a little interesting that it's the tandem Um, but together as you mentioned you know 1300 you know 1300 yards and 11 touchdowns like that's impressive Um, yeah I think if the Crimson Tide can run on the Wolverines I I think that's how they get it done is that what you're going to predict right now, that they can run on Michigan and Nick Saban moves on to another championship appearance? So allow me to get into my game pick. <laughs> At Alabama is no stranger. I've said that. Set but in recent years, neither are the Wolverines. They can't get past that first game. I don't know if it's something in the air in Detroit, certainly not basketball. But how about those Detroit Lions, you know, finally getting over there, cursed – Cursed ways of losing 30 years. year after year. 30 years. Clinched a playoff spot, won their division. Um, I think that the Michigan Wolverines finally get past ah. that first round and defeat the Alabama Crimson Tide in a very close, exciting, high-octane game. Nice. The I got to agree that this is the, the, the game, of the better game of the two games in the playoff here. Um. I, I talked to my father-in-law, Rich Payton, before we got on here. Big Michigan fan. He he bleeds blue. He bleeds blue. And uh, definitely, definitely got to res- respect Nick Saban. You know, Nick Saban usually has, you know, about a week to prepare for teams. You give him a whole month. Oh, boy. That that that'd make me nervous, giving Nick Saban a whole month to prepare for me. Um, I, I love the running game. I love the running game for Michigan. That offensive line is huge. The first, the top ranked defense, according to points per game allowed, Michigan. That 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 says something to me. This is the team with the most adversity this year. It it really seems like it could be a Cinderella story for Michigan. I got Michigan also taking down I, Alabama, the one loss Crimson Tide, Alabama. It's gonna be a hell of a game. I'm not gonna be surprised either way. If it's a blowout, yeah, I'll be surprised in a blowout. But either team wins, I won't be surprised. As I was looking into things, trying to gather resources and and just try and make the best decision, it's funny if you look at the the lines for Vegas because I think the betting favorite is Michigan, but the second like biggest odds are for Alabama to upset. So it's it's super interesting the way that's panning out. Yeah, it seems like the odds makers are saying the winner of this game is going to win it all. In the other game, on Monday, 645 Mountain Time on ESPN, the All-State Sugar Bowl, we got the undefeated Huskies out of the Pac-12, Washington, taking on the one-loss Longhorns of Texas. Let's start with Washington here, Sam. They have an eighth-ranked strength of schedule out of the Pac-12. They averaged over 37 points per game. That was 11th in the nation. 
They gave up over 23. That was sixth in the Pac-12. That's That opened my eyes right there. Sixth in the Pac-12, tw- over 23 po- 23.6 points per game allowed. But they averaged 344 passing yards per game. That led the nation. Heisman runner-up Michael Penix Jr., the Indiana Hoosiers transfer, he led the nation with 4,218 passing yards. He threw for 33 touchdowns. That was tied for fourth in the nation. Running back Dylan Johnson, he rushed for 1,113 yards. That was top 30 in the nation. 14 rushing touchdowns. That was top 15 in the nation. Washington, they had two 1,000-yard receivers this year. Two 1,000-yard receivers led by Rome Adunze. He had 81 receptions, which was top 20. For 1,428 yards, that was third in the nation. For 13 touchdowns, that was tied for sixth in the nation. We're going to see a Dunze on Sundays, okay? Mark mark that down. The other 1,000-yard receiver for the Huskies was Jalen Polk. He had 60 catches for 1,000 yards even with eight touchdowns. Sam, can Washington complete a perfect season in the last year of the Pac-12? You talk about seeing guys on Sunday, Penix, you'll be seeing him too. He's been, his name's been thrown around for a top, top five pick. Um, ah, this is tough. I, I really respect what Washington's done this year of, of all the things they've accomplished. I think something that we can't overlook is two victories over uh, rival Oregon. Oh yeah. That's, that's impressive to me. That, that says a lot, especially since um, Oregon had their own stud at the quarterback position. Um, yeah, there's a lot to like. I think I think Pinnix does have to be that guy that kind of puts the team on his back. I think he, he needs to play out of his mind in order to win this game. Um, the passing attack is prolific, and I think, I don't know, they're impressive, but um, that's going to be tough. It's going to be tough against the Texas Longhorns. Speaking of those Longhorns, they're ranked 15th according to strength of schedule. They average just over 36 points per game. That was 17th in the nation. 17 and a half points per game allowed. That led the Big 12 and was 13th nationally. Their quarterback, Quinn Ewers, sophomore, threw for 3,161 yards, 21 to 6 touchdown to interception ratio, and added five touchdowns on the ground. Junior running back, Jonathan Brooks, led the backfield. He had 1,139 rushing yards. That was 22nd in the nation and 10 rushing touchdowns. Also, another running back, freshman, C.J. Baxter. He had 595 rushing yards. So a couple guys in the backfield there. Texas also had three guys over 600 receiving yards. Junior Xavier Worthy led them in yards with 969. Junior Adane Mitchell led the receiving corps with 10 receiving touchdowns. And let's not sleep on sophomore tight end Jatavion Sanders. Look out for him next year. Sam, is Texas the one team here that no one's talking about? I don't think they're being talked about enough. Um, they might be the dark, the dark horse. And what's really interesting to me is to look back and just see how each year they've gotten better and better. And I think that speaks volumes to the coaching. Um, yeah, they, they produce some really good running backs there. Um, you know, we'll probably be talking about him later, but it will be John Robinson, the former Longhorn. Had a great career there. Roshan Johnson last year. Roshan Johnson. Both of them. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And they let, as you just mentioned, multiple guys can feast in that backfield. They're doing the same thing this year. Um, what I like about Texas over Washington is just, again, it's not so much Michael Penix and 2,000 yard receivers. You have a couple of running backs, a couple of receivers, a good defense. Um, so they seem a little bit more well rounded to me. And I think not maybe having as much pressure as the other teams that, yeah, they might, they might be a dark horse, might go all the way. For this game pick here for the Sugar Bowl, uh, I'm looking at the 23.6 points per game allowed from Washington, the defense that was sixth in the Pac-12. I'm looking at the Longhorns. They went on the road to Tuscaloosa, beat Alabama by 10 this year. Washington, you know, I'm, I'm not sure about the Pac-12. Last season of the conference, it'd be a it'd be a magical story. But, damn it, I'm, I'm, I got them losing. I got the Longhorns moving on to the championship game. 
Yeah, I, I have the same. Um, Washington, this is a great season, but show me. I don't know. It's not enough for me to, to pick them. Um, Texas is tough, and yeah, I, I just I don't think people are talking enough about them. I think it'll be close, just like the other game, but ultimately, I don't think that Washington can handle them, and I, I think the Longhorns will be victorious in this one as well. So we got the same championship matchup here for the college football playoff, Sam. And we're going to be talking again before the the finale. So we'll be breaking down the championship game again. So quickly, I'm I'm not getting off the the Wolverines. I'm not getting off the Wolverines. I picked them a couple of weeks ago when the, the playoff was announced. I'm sticking to them. All the adversity, the running game, the defense, free hardball. I think it, I, I – I think Michigan is going to raise a banner for the first time since 1997. Yeah, Michigan, Michigan's been there the last couple of years and they haven't been able to get past that first game. They definitely get past that first game, but uh, they don't get past the second one for me. I got the Texas Longhorns. Longhorns. Yeah, I, I, I'm impressed. I'm impressed with their regular season. I mean, you mentioned it kind of stole the words right out of my mouth, went into Alabama and took it to them by 10 points um yeah I think I think Michigan is going to win and I think they're going to be riding high and underestimate Texas and I think yeah I think Texas is going to be our uh, college national champion this year moving along this week on the don't tell mama sports podcast we got big news out of the MLB major league baseball the Los Angeles Dodgers have signed 25-year-old Japanese pitching sensation Yoshinobu Yamamoto to a 12-year, $325 million contract. This is the largest contract for a pitcher in MLB history and the fourth highest total value ever for any player. This comes after the Dodgers inked Shohei Otani to a 10-year, $700 million contract about two weeks ago. Yamamoto said the Dodgers were his favorite team growing up, and he would have signed with them even if Otani had went elsewhere. The Dodgers are required to pay a posting fee of $50.6 million to the Oryx Buffaloes, Yamamoto's former club. Yamamoto is coming off his third consecutive MVP award and posted a 1.82 ERA over seven seasons. Sam, what do you think about a 25-year-old Japanese pitching sensation getting the fourth largest contract in MLB history? It's wild. And between these two gentlemen, we're talking over a billion. Billion with a B. A b- 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 billion dollars. B. It's it's incredible. I mean, he's he's a talent. Like his last four years with the Buffaloes have been incredible. And when they introduced him um, to Dodgers Nation, they talked about their scouting department and how a lot of them had gone to see him play in person and just were sort of gushing over him and how impressed they were. Um, it's incredible that a move like this was made, especially for someone that's never even played in the MLB before. Um, but obviously the numbers and his skills and his talents you know, speak for themselves. Um, yeah, the Dodgers are, they're going all in. They just went Ooh. like this and pushed all their chips to the middle Ooh. of the table. Um, Matt, let me ask you this. If, if it's not a deep playoff run or a championship, I mean, is it, is it that or bust for, for the Dodgers with these big moves that they're making? It has to be. It has to be with, you know, you got former MVPs and Mookie Betts, Freddie Freeman on the roster, you know, Shohei Otani teams up with them. You know, the the question always comes, Max will tell you too, with the with the Dodgers, the pitching is the is the pitching staff. And, you know, maybe maybe this is the guy that they need. Maybe this is the ace, their their freaking horse that's gonna lead them. It'd be the game one starter and it's it's high expectations in Los Angeles. I I would have to agree that yeah, championship or bust. That that has to be the goal this year for the Dodgers. I think about that contract, twelve years. <laughs> Obviously, things happen, uh, but 
25, I'm 30, 25 seems like so long ago. And he would be 37 and 37 for me now seems like so far in the future. That's a long time to be a Dodger. I hope he really likes that team. (laughs) Yeah, seriously. Uh, Finish up this segment here with, uh, are the Dodgers your favorite to win it all next season? And will you be joining me to see them play the Rockies this year? Because, you know, divisional matchup, they're going to be here plenty of games this season. Oh, absolutely. Rockies Stadium is gorgeous. Um, I caught a game there uh, this past year. Um, Rockies are terrible. They got a lot to figure out. They got a long way to go. Um, But when you're in a city with a bad team, one of the best things to do is go to a game when they play somebody that you want to see. And I will definitely be joining you if I can. Ah, I guess I got to give it to them for the moves that they've made. They got to be my favorite. They got to be. They're my favorite too. Definitely need to go check those World Series odds. Maybe maybe get a good price on them right now before they they go on a you know ten twelve game winning streak in May. You know you might get good odds on them right now. Yeah. Just got an announcement to to make here real quick. We I hope I'm pronouncing this right. I think it's it's pronounced to share to share Vizen. It is an authentic Bavarian wheat beer. From the oldest, it's the oldest wheat beer brewery of Nuremberg, okay? If I could describe this jefe in one word, I'd say fluffy. Fluffy, okay? Mm-hmm. Announcement. If, if you want to drink a fluffy beer, apparently that's the one you got to, that's the one you got to drink. You're right. Moving along this week, we got to talk about some more news here in Denver, Colorado, talking about talking about Denver sports here a little bit, but we got to talk about Aaron Gordon, the Nuggets forward. He's going to miss some time after suffering lacerations to his face and shooting hand after being attacked by a dog on Christmas. Gordon is said to be in good, good condition after requiring 21 stitches. The two way champion this season is averaging 13.6 points, 6.9 boards, and 3.4 assists. He does a little bit of everything. He's going to guard your best player on the other end of the court. Big body, physical, tough, hustles. I like Aaron Gordon a lot. The Nuggets are 23-10. and 10. The defending champion Nuggets, okay, are 23-10 and 10 and second in the Western Conference right now. Sam, what do you think about Aaron Gordon, this dog attack, and will you be going to see the Nuggets this season? He's a great player. There's, I mean, what's not to like, and he's the people's champion. He was out in the streets of Denver, Colorado with us. Oh yeah. Celebrating with the people chugging beers. Uh, Yeah. He's a great player and he's exciting. This team is exciting. This story is crazy. And it's one reason why I love the don't tell mama sports podcast because you get a little bit of everything. Got the stuff that everybody's talking about. And then you got dog attacks. (laughs) As, as far as this dog attack, I can shed a little light. I am a medical professional, but I speak from experience. I was also bitten by a dog when I was about to go into high school. It was bad. Sucker took a chunk out of my leg. With animal bites, the concern is infection. So they don't really like to stitch you up too much because they don't want to like seal that infection in there. Um, my dog bite was bad. I had, I had to go to the ER, had to get stitched up. And I got five stitches, okay? And the scar that I have on my leg is massive. You can spot it from far away. So when I hear that he has 21 stitches to his hand and his face, this is a serious, serious injury and a serious bite. To need that many stitches, wow. I I would not want to be Aaron Gordon right now, you know, my thoughts go out to him and his family. That's that's tough. I, I'm curious what the timeline will be on him returning. And also, just as more time goes, getting more information on what happened. Because this is a crazy story. I don't know, Matt. What do you think? Yeah, I definitely more needs to come out about it. I, I heard from one report that it was a family dog. Not sure. It wasn't really uh, verified from other sources if it was a family dog or not. But, yeah, he's going to miss some time. You know, shooting hand. That. If he's got stitches, he's gonna have to wait for that. And you know, good, good insight from you there as a as a as a male nurse. You know, one of our one of our popular male nurse guests on this podcast, and a former dog bite victim, and a former victim from a from a dog bite. 
Are you going to be seeing the Nuggets this year, Sam? Absolutely. Um, everybody's talking about the Nuggets, the buzz in, in Colorado, Denver. It's big. Uh, even my girlfriend, who's really not big into sports, she has mentioned to me multiple times she would love to go to a game. Last highlight we want to hit on here this week on the Don't Tell Mama Sports Podcast. The Detroit Pistons, the bad boys of yesterday, have set the NBA record for the most consecutive losses within a single season. With 28 straight losses now, they are currently 2-29 and 29 on the season. They are 28th in points per game, 25th in points per game allowed. Just last night, they played at Boston. Oh, boy, people were, people were feeling it. People in Motown were feeling it, feeling it last night. In Boston, Detroit had a 21-point lead in the second half. A 21-point lead in the second half. Celtics came back. They forced OT, and they fucking won. Pistons streak, the Pistons losing streak moves on. Sam, let me just run through these draft picks real quick that the Pistons have on their roster. And not all of them have they drafted. A couple of them they got from other teams that other teams yeah. gave up on. And Detroit's now taking a taking sure. a challenge, taking a risk on them. But of course, you got the first overall pick in Cade Cunningham. That's the leader of the team, averaging over twenty a game. You got a second overall pick in Marvin Bagley, came over from Sacramento out of Duke. Second overall pick in James Wiseman came over from Golden State out of Memphis. You know we got our guy Jaden Ivey, who was the fifth overall pick out of Purdue. We got uh, Usar Thompson, fifth overall pick this season from the G League. We got a seventh overall pick, an 18-year-old point guard at the time, Killian Hayes. Okay, he hasn't he hasn't done shit in four years. Kevin Knox was the ninth overall pick out of Kentucky for the Knicks. He's now on the Pistons roster. And then you got Pistons, more first-rounders that the Pistons picked, and uh, Jalen Duran out of Memphis, 13th overall. Isaiah Beef Stew Stewart, 16th overall, and then Marcus Sasser out of Houston, 25th overall. Now that that it's hard to find, let's see here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven top picks, seven top ten picks on a roster. Detroit has seven top ten picks on their roster. Yes, they're young. Yes, they're building. Sam, what the fuck is going on in Detroit? It's unbelievable. You almost have to try and be that bad and go that long without winning a game. Um, I don't know how long it's going to continue. I don't know if this record will ever be broken. Um, it's impressive in the most negative way possible. Uh, yeah, I, I just think with, with the points you're making about their young players and their top picks, I mean, talent's not everything. And you see it a lot with the NFL, bad teams like the Lions or the Jaguars, you know, year after year getting those top picks. And it doesn't always correlate right away to success. Um, you got to I mean, it's, it's a big step up the pros from college and you got a lot of big personalities and trying, trying to mesh them. And I think probably what they're lacking is some, some veteran presence and veteran leadership. Um, I mean, year after year, you see that with winning sports teams, a young talent, a healthy dose of young talent. But then there's always those veteran guys that sort of hold it all down and hold everything together and show those young dudes the way to go. So in my, in my eyes, that's that's the problem there. Um, clearly, there's, it's, it's more than that. There's a lot of things going on to have them be in this position. But uh, I don't know. I don't know what more I can really say on it. What do you think? I'd be uh, I'd be sorry to leave out uh, the second leading scorer on the team, Boyan Bogdanovic, thirty four year old. But that's the only that's the only veteran presence on the team. He's only played twelve games this year. Mm. It's a lot of talent. It's a lot of a lot of good college players. Um, I don't know if you want to look at the coaching. You might have to look at the coaching. But yeah, the uh, there might not be that voice in the locker room. Maybe Kate Cunningham can develop into that guy. Averaging over 23 points, four boards, seven assists. You know, number one pick, you're, you you got to be that guy. And, you know, he missed most of last season with a broken shin, I believe. But he's back. He's healthy to pair with some nice young bigs. Detroit should be better than this. Sam, let's wrap up this with uh, getting your opinion on, 
on this. The worst record for an NBA team in an 82-game season was the 1972-73 Philadelphia 76ers, who finished 9-73. and But they started 3-27. and Okay, the, the Pistons are 2-29 and right now. Those Sixers started 3-27. and My question to you is, can the Pistons win 10 games this year, or will they be the worst team ever in the NBA? How many more games left? They Ballpark. are. They are uh, thirty-one. So we got we got fifty-one games left. We got fifty-one games left, and they got two wins. So they have fifty-one chances to win eight games. Is what you're saying? Can they go eight and forty-three? Yeah, they've got to. <laughs> Come on, they've got to win eight games in fifty-one. I think they can get to ten. Call me an optimist. I don't know. I got to agree with you with that talent. I think Monty Williams gets the boys together. I mean, seven top ten picks on the roster. You got to mesh them together. You got nice, young, athletic bigs. Jade Nivey on the wing. I like Jade Nivey. Detroit, give me 12 or 13 wins. Surprise, surprise us this year, okay? Welcome back here to the Don't Tell Mama Sports Podcast, and we're going to finish up this week's episode with some NFL talk. To start us off here, we got to do our game picks, Sam. We ain't done game picks for a couple weeks. but uh, Let's get into them. We're going to get back into them this week because, damn it, it's week 17, and a lot of these games matter. A lot of these games matter. First one, like I said at the beginning of this episode, this is Friday. It's not Wednesday. Thursday game already happened. Browns beat down the Jets 37-20. Ain't no reason to talk about that because tomorrow night we got a juicy one. Saturday night prime time on ESPN. The 11-4 NFC North champions, the Detroit Lions, going to Dallas to take on the 10-5 Cowboys. This is one of the better games of the week. Might be the juiciest game of the week. It has the highest over-under on the week, 51.5 points. Sam, where are you leaning on this one? I just got to say, I got to sh- I gotta give some love to Lions fans. 30 if years. You're a Ly- if you're a Lions fan, you're really a fan because it has been bad for a long time. Congratulations to you. Congratulations to the city. They haven't won a title in decades. Since so, you, you're, you were born. Yeah. I mean – so congratulations. I mean, as a Colts fan, I don't know what it's like to go more than three, four <laughs> all years. Right, all right. I, I mean, seriously, people talk about like why I'm a big Colts fan. I grew up in the Peyton Manning era. Like we were always winning. And so I don't know what it's like to just wait and suffer for decades. So congrats to the Detroit Lions. And if you're a Lions fan, I'm super happy for you. They're a great team. Fun, exciting. I got the Cowboys in this one, boys. (laughs) With that being said. (laughs) With that being said, I don't like the Cowboys. I never have. Um, I got cousins in Texas. I always talk and smack to them. Um, But I think the Lions are riding high. um, And people might be overlooking some late season struggles that they've had. It seems like they kind of got out of that slump they were in a few weeks ago. But, um, yeah, I (laughs) – Dak Prescott has been on fire, and CeeDee Lamb, forget about it. Um, I think Dallas gets right. Um, they got a lot to play for, and the Eagles are, I mean, they're right there. So they can't they can't let, you know, more than a couple games slip. So I got the Cowboys over the Lions in this one. It's going to be fun. <clears throat> toss-up game here, and mostly when I see a toss-up game, I go with the home team. I lean the home teams away, and – I think the Cowboys do have more urgency for this one. And, you know, a good letdown spot for the Lions in this game, too, you know, coming off that high of being NFC North champions. I don't know. Something tells me to take Detroit. Something tells me to take Detroit in this one on the road. I'm going to ride with the Lions. I know. I I, oh. it, it, I know. I know. I, toss-up game, I always go with the home team, and Cowboys have more urgency. But something's telling me to go with the Lions here. <laughs> I, I uh, Bless you. I won a I won a little ticket on the uh on the Lions winning the division. I put that down at the beginning of the season. So nice nice little payout there. Positive money when uh beginning of the season. 
Moving in to the Sunday games, we got an AFC East matchup between the New England Patriots, who are 4-11. and They're going to Buffalo to take on the Bills, who are 9-6. and These two teams played in Week 7. In New England, the Patriots got them 29-25. to Sam, do you see a season sweep here for the Patriots? Absolutely not. The Bills have figured things out. They're rolling after their uh, change at offensive coordinator. They're running the ball more with James Cook. Um, it's funny we talked about the Lions and the Bills back-to-back because I am struggling to decide who to play at my flex position between David Montgomery Ooh, and Stephon Diggs. Get into it. I mean, it's a, it's a philosophy pick or an analytical pick. David Montgomery, even though Jameer Gibbs has been coming on, still getting 10 to 18 carries the last several games, getting a consistent 10, 9, 11, 12, 10, 11, 13 fantasy points. Whereas the last month, Stefan Diggs has been bad. Like, he's been bad. And they're running the ball more in Buffalo. But it's like the second I sit my star, my keeper, Diggs has been good for me for years. Of course, if I sit him, he's going to go off. And it's against the New England Patriots, who he has their number. All his games against the Patriots the last several years, he's balled out. I don't know. It's tough. I feel like I stick with my star. And even though he's he's been down, I stand by his side, and he rewards me with a, a typical Stefan Diggs game. But eh, it's tough. I agree with you that I have the Bills in this game with the Patriots. And, yeah, Montgomery or Stephon Diggs in that flex spot, that's tough. Like you said, Stephon has had some some solid games against the Patriots uh, the last few seasons, those divisional matchups. It's tough to bench a keeper. I was sitting in that situation last night with Garrett Wilson, and what did I do? I started Garrett Wilson. He gave me fucking seven points. But, you know, that's the risk I took. And, you know, Stephon Diggs might give you seven points. He might. I feel like there's a higher ceiling with Diggs and a higher floor with Montgomery. Uh, but to win the championship, I feel like you got to risk it all. I don't know. It's uh, it's risky. I hope it doesn't come down to that decision. I hope your matchup doesn't come down to that. Same here, buddy. Another good game on Sunday morning, a toss-up here. The 7-8 and eight Atlanta Falcons going to Chicago to take on the Bears, who are 6-9. and nine. Where, are you, where are you going here, Sammy? This to me is a sneaky, great game. I mean, there's a there's, awesome. playoff, there's playoff implications. There's fantasy implications. Got some studs on both teams. Um, for me, the way I leaned in this one, I, I've got Chicago. I got Chicago. I think Falcons would be riding high after that victory over the Colts. Um, I don't know. I just like Justin Fields, and as long as he's got DJ Moore and he's got that running ability, I think I think the Bears will get it done at home. I think the Falcons are a better home team. They're a better dome team. So I think dome. the Bears get them. I agree with you right there, Sammy. Uh, I got the Bears at home. Justin Fields has made the Bears look like a, a different team since he's been back. Falcons, uh, they're, they're just too inconsistent. I don't like them. They're not going to the playoffs this year. They're losing this one. Another divisional matchup that we have on Sunday morning. In our division, the AFC South, the five and ten Titans going to Houston to play the eight and seven Houston Texans. They played two weeks ago in week fifteen, and Houston got the Titans in Nashville, nineteen to sixteen in overtime. I'll lead us off here, Sam, being real quick. This is going to be a season sweep for Houston. CJ Stroud is back. As a Titans fan, boys, you see the Derrick Henry jersey back here. Titans fan sitting right here. I don't want to win. I don't want to win. Let's get a top five pick. Let's get a top five pick, boys. Add up the losses. Let's have five wins on the season and go into next year with a with a solid pick. Are you going to disagree with me here? No. Um, the Titans didn't get them at home without C.J. Stroud. So in Houston with C.J. Stroud, no chance. Texans sweep. Big one here, Sammy, the 7-8 Las Vegas Raiders. All of a sudden on a little tear. Going to Indianapolis, your hometown, to take on your eight and seven Colts. Now I know you're not going to take the Raiders in this one. You're not going to pick against your Colts. Tell me what the biggest X factor is to get this one done. You're right, smart guy. Uh, going with the Colts. Hey, I'm having deja vu big time from two years ago with Carson Wentz when 
everything was right in front of us. All we had to do was win, win out, beat the Jaguars or the Raiders, and we ended up dropping them both and missing the playoffs. New regime, new coach, new everything. Here we find ourselves, got to play the Raiders, and not the Jags, but another division rival in the Texans right after that. If we win these two games, it's simple. We make the playoffs. Ah, if we lose both, we're obviously out. If we split them, I think it's going to be tough. So I think we got to win out. The Raiders are playing hard for uh, that interim coach who might just be the head coach next year. Um, I think the X factor is going to be one Michael Pittman Jr. He's out of concussion protocol. All signs are pointing to go. I think under head coach Shane Steichen, he's not going to stand for a performance like that and then drop another one at home in front of the fans. Uh, I got the Colts in this one. Yeah, you mentioned Antonio Pierce taking over for the Raiders. If he doesn't get the job, I don't know what the fuck's going on in Las Vegas because he he's he's changed that team a little bit. They're seven and eight, kind of fighting for a wild card, not really, but having some life in the season. Colts definitely having a lot to play for here at home. I'm back and forth on this game. I obviously don't want to take the Colts. I fucking hate the Colts. But I toss up game. I'm gonna go with the home team in the in the Colts. I mean, sixty three points hung on the Chargers from the Raiders, and then they back that up with beating the Chiefs on Christmas in Kansas City. That fuck it. I'm going Raiders. Fuck the Colts. I'm going Raiders. Two game winning streak for the Raiders. They surprised us on Christmas. Ten and a half point underdogs get that get that one done. Twenty to fourteen. Raiders on the road. They're they're playing for Antonio Pierce right now. They got a lot of juice. Fuck the Colts. And uh, the week before that, zero points when they lost the Vikings three to nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. People forget that, that one. That one makes me quiver. That one makes my sphincter tighten. Okay, <laughs> another one in the morning slate. The eight and seven Los Angeles Rams going to New York to take on the five and ten Giants. Tyrod Taylor is getting the nod at quarterback over Tommy DeVito. Does it matter? It doesn't. I got the Rams. The Rams have something to play for uh, with Kyron Williams, Puka Nakua, Cooper Cup, Matthew Stafford. Weapons. That's all I got. They're going to win. Weapons. Yeah. Rams, take, take them on the line there. Five and a half. I'll take those. Easy. Uh, another quick one here in the morning games, the 3-12 and 12 Arizona Cardinals going to Philly. Take on the 11-4 and 4 Eagles. This one's going to be a smacking. Eagles are favored by 12. Fire up your Eagles. I'm firing up Trey McBride. Hopefully that there's some garbage time. He's probably the number one number one option for Kyler Murray. Eagles, big time here. Flip, flip, flip Philadelphia. Um, garbage time points for Cardinals players, fantasy-wise. Look into that. Um, Eagles secondary can be uh, thrown on. So, you know, Kyler Murray, wide receivers, Trey McBride, look into that. But outside of that, yeah, Philly easily wins. Toss up game in the NFC South. The seven and eight Saints going to Tampa to take on the eight and seven Buccaneers. The two, these two teams played in week four. Tampa Bay got them 26 to nine in New Orleans. Do you see a season, season sweep for the Bucs and Baker Makeweave? I do. It's time for the Bucs to quit playing around. They've been on a winning streak, they're over 500. Give some respect to this NFC South division. Win out and make the playoffs with a respectable record. Baker Mayfield's chucking that thing. Mike Evans is playing out of his skull. I got the Buccaneers sweeping the Saints. Buccaneers on a four-game winning streak. They get the Saints, and then they go to Carolina. The division is theirs to have. I think Tampa. Tampa's going to the playoffs. Tampa's going to the playoffs somehow. Another smacking in the morning games, the 11-4 San Francisco 49ers going to Washington to take on the 4-11 Washington football queefs. They're going to get smacked. 13.5-point favorites. Niners getting this done. One word, 49ers. Another game in the morning slate, the 2-13 and 13 Panthers, who you saw in person this year in Carolina. They're going to Jacksonville, take on the eight and seven Jags. No Trevor Lawrence in this one. We see the line drop by about three points. Doesn't matter on the money line. Jags are getting this one done at home. They need this one. Travis Etienne, put them in your lineup, boys. Don't be scared. That close game they had against the Packers gives me like a millisecond of pause, but yeah, I got the Jags in this one, even with a backup quarterback. <laughs> Possibly the juiciest game of the week, the winner 
has the inside route at the AFC number one seed in that bye week. We got the 11 and four Miami Dolphins going to Baltimore to take on the 12 and three Ravens. Oh, baby, this one's juicy. It's going to be high powered. Sam, what are you thinking here? Somehow those NFL schedulers always get it right. Thank you, you football gods. You see. <laughs> this one is whew, it's tough. Um, the Ravens just beat the 49ers in California. Um, they're, they're the number one team in the AFC. Um, ultimately, I just don't think – I just don't I don't think I believe in Tua. Um he's a good quarterback, but I don't think I believe in him. Um and I feel like the Ravens they're just on a tear and that defense that de- defense wins championships and Lamar's pl- having an MVP season once again. Um so yeah, I got the Ravens in this one over the Dolphins. You mentioned the tear the Ravens are on. Nine and one in their last ten games. Nine and one in the last ten. They won five in a row. Like you said, against the Niners on Christmas. I think they were like six and a half point underdogs in that one on the road. Thirty three to nineteen. Going Ravens here, boys, back at home. Tua, Tua, he's got to prove some things, but the Dolphins are definitely gonna be in the playoffs. Moving into the afternoon games, we got a good one here. The eight and seven Steelers, who look like they might have woken up. I'm not sure though. They're going up to Seattle, take on the 8-7 and seven Seahawks. This baby's a toss-up. I don't know who's going to be playing quarterback for Pittsburgh. Is it Mason Rudolph? Is it Mitch queef Is it Kenny Pickett? All three of those guys are fucking queefs. It doesn't matter who starts. Seattle's getting this one done at home. Seattle has a real chance to make the playoffs um, at home. There's no way they lose to the Steelers. Got a juicy one coming here to Denver, Colorado in the AFC West. Got the 5-10 and 10 Easton Stick-led Los Angeles Chargers. Taking on the 7-8 and eight Jarrett Stidham-led Denver Broncos. These two teams be- played back in week 14. Denver got them in Los Angeles 24-7. We see uh, the Broncos bench their quarterback this week, Sam Russell Wilson. Uh, you know, high, high, high money man, two poops a week, Wilson. Having a solid season, but uh, we see the Broncos bench him. Not eliminated, not eliminated yet, but kind of out of the playoff contention. What do you think about that move from Sean Payton and the crew? Yeah, Sean Payton's making it pretty clear. He's there. It's his team. He's there to stay. And he doesn't care how much money they've paid Russell Wilson. He wants to win. And, you know, Russell's towards the end of his career. And I think, I think they're ready to move on. At least the head coaches, um, they're benching him and there's uh, some kind of clause in his contract about a physical in March. And I think they're trying to avoid him getting injured so they can get some of those millions back and maybe start a rebuild. Um, As far as my pick for this game, which translates to, I got the Broncos beating the Chargers. Yeah. It's an awkward situation there for Russell Wilson. I guess they, they came, the Broncos came to him after that chiefs win and said, uh, if he doesn't waive that injury clause that that they were going to sit him and, he didn't waive it, and Broncos sat him. Um, it's unfortunate. It's a, it's a weird clause in the contract, the injury injury clause. Um, but yeah, this game this game's gonna be gonna be rough. I got the Broncos at home. We saw the Chargers. They 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 suck. They're done. Keenan Allen's not playing. Austin Eckler shouldn't be playing. But uh, I'll be out there. Me and Kelly are gonna be tailgating. With uh, Evan and Crystal McDougal, south side of the stadium. Okay, you want, look out for us on the south sta- side of the stadium. We're going to be tailgating and we're planning on going. We're planning on going and getting tickets because tickets keep coming down, boys. They keep they keep losing. Now they benched Russell Wilson. Ain't nobody want to see the Chargers, Chargers led by Easton Stick. So I, I might be in there this weekend, Sam. 
last game in the afternoon slate on Sunday. This is going to be a solid one. The 8-7 and seven Cincinnati Bengals going to Kansas City and playing the Chiefs who are 9-6. and six. Notice I said 9-6 and six, Kansas City Chiefs. That's uh, I believe I heard that's the most losses for Patrick Mahomes in his career. I, believe that I heard that's the most losses for Patty. Not going to lose seven. They're going to get this one done at home. Bengals, you know, we, we counted them out a few weeks ago, and they, they're fighting. Bengals are fighting, but they're going to lose this one on the road. Bengals are fighting, and uh, with this one, I, I did struggle, and um, I really try to not let the popular narrative sway me. Chiefs are struggling, and I don't think all of a sudden they just get right. Um, a lot of times you see teams bounce back after a bad loss. I don't think so. I got the Bengals in an upset here, boys. Oh. I, think, I think the Bengals are going to go oh. in, go in and, and beat the Chiefs at home. Uh, what do they call it? Uh, Burrowhead? Now it'll be uh, Brownie Browning Head. Camp? <laughs> Browning Head? <laughs> I heard uh, after those first three games for Jake Browning, the uh, the NFL game uh, random drug test to check on those PEDs. Sounds about <laughs> right. <laughs> Moving into the last game on the week 17 slate. There's no Monday this week. There's no Monday for the rest of the season. On week 17, Sunday night football on NBC primetime, baby. Both teams at 7-8 and eight in the NFC North. The Packers are going to Minnesota. Minnesota went to Green Bay in week 7, beat them by two touchdowns. I see a season sweep here. Minnesota... They don't know. I don't know if they know that who they're going to start a QB. Jaron Hall, Nick Mullins, Joshua Dobbs. I got Minnesota getting this one done at home. Justin Jefferson's back. Ty Chandler in a good matchup. He's in my flex. Packers, Jordan Love, solid season. See you next year. Yeah, I don't know, Kerry Andrew. I don't know if I'm waiting all day for this one. Uh, <laughs> but I got the Packers. Um, I think the Packers get this one done in a who cares kind of game. Um, I guess, I don't know, maybe there are playoff implications. I'm not sure, though. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've seen a lot of good things from Jordan Love. I think people are so quick, to, uh, you know, a couple bad games, draft somebody. But, yeah, I think the Packers have been patient on Jordan Love, and I think he's he's shown some signs. And I think you draft some players and keep building, and I kind of like what the Packers have going. Moving into the last segment this week. On the Don't Tell Mama Sports Podcast, we got our extra juicy dogs. Ho, 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 ho. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we had to put on our Christmas onesies for this one, Sam. Got to pull up the hoods for this last segment. Give us your extra juicy quarterback at the week, at, at the quarterback position for week 17. My extra juicy dog at the quarterback position. Talked about him earlier. It's going to be C.J. Stroud. Back after two weeks on the concussion protocol with something to play for. Uh, the Texans are still in it. They're at home. Um, Titans are tough against the run, but they can be thrown on. And what do we know about C.J. Stroud? He likes to sling the rock. They're going to be throwing up and down the field. Uh, there's a three-way tie for first place in the AFC South with the Jags and the Colts. Hey, Texans, it's right there. It's right there. No Trevor Lawrence for the Jags. Uh, He's going to let it rip. He was balling out fantasy wise um, before the injury. I think he gets back to it. And uh, yeah, CJ Stroud, extra juicy dog. CJ Stroud, probably the rookie of the year. Um, I don't know how they're only favored by four over the Titans. I'll be taking Houston at home in that one. I like, I like that pick Sam. My extra juicy dog at the quarterback position for week 17 going to be Derek Carr. I went down a little bit here. They're at, excuse me, they're at Tampa Bay. Derek Carr, he's QB 18 on the season, but he's had three touchdowns each of the last two games. These last two weeks have been his best fantasy performances of the season. The Saints are two and a half point road underdogs. They're going to have to throw to keep up with these books. If they want to win the division, they're going to have to win this game. Tampa Bay, they're 27th against the quarterback position in fantasy points allowed. They just gave up big games to Jordan Love and a career-high 347 passing yards to Desmond Ritter. Desmond Ritter had a career-high 347 yards against these Buccaneers. Derek Carr, you know, if you had Justin Herbert, if you had, you know, 
uh, Joe Burrow. You might have picked up Derek Carr. You can put him in in your championship championship matchup if you're in a pickle. I like that pick, Matt. Um, Derek Carr is a solid quarterback. He can throw the deep ball. I really like the connection uh, with the young guy, uh, Shahid. Um, and yeah, I got the Bucks winning this one, but um, somehow every team in the NFC South is still in it except for the, the Panthers. So yeah, lots to play for, and I like the pick. I, I like Derek Carr. Um, moving into the running back position, I'll go ahead and jump in with my guy. Going to kind of get back to my ways. My ways last week, if you watched, I was picking all players on my own fantasy team. It seemed to work out for me because I got that dove heading into the championship. So I'm going to, what the heck, I'm going to try again. Why not? Got Bijan Robinson, boys. Bijan Robinson. He's my extra juicy dog at the running back position. Uh, the Atlanta Falcons have made the switch to Taylor Heineke. Um, and Heineke, like a lot of backup quarterbacks, is slinging it. Having no fear, that's what you do when you come in as a backup quarterback, got nothing to lose. Um, he lets it rip. And Bijan saw a season high, uh, 10 targets in the passing game with Taylor Heineke at the helm. Uh, I really like that. Bijan's really good. Um, catching the ball, catch and run. Um, yeah, he took those 10 targets uh, for seven catches and 50 yards, um, 12 carries for 72 against Mike Colts. Um, and he did all of that while Algier and Cordell Patterson were also feasting. So that, that impressed me. Um, I think Arthur Smith, if you, if you want to win out and see if something can happen, stop fooling around with this, uh, John Smith from the backfield reverse. What are you doing? Give the ball to Bijan four speed Bijan, and you're going to have success. The, the, the kid's a stud. He's a star. Um, they're going to run. They're playing outdoors in Chicago. You're not in the dome. Run the damn ball. And uh, my buddy, Mr. Tutty, oh. Bijan Robinson, falling in the end zone, boys. First one of the week, boys. Nice. Good pick on Bijan there. I, you took the words right out of my mouth. Arthur Smith, he's fucking around too much. I think he. I think he's coaching for his job. I think he's coaching for his job. He's fucking around too much for, with Bijan. If, this, if the Falcons want to win this, this division, they got to feed him. They got to feed him. They should have been feeding him months ago. My extra juicy dog at the running back position for week 17 is going to be my guy, Travis Etienne versus the Panthers. Okay. He's had a couple, he's had two down weeks. Okay. These last two weeks, efficiency was awful, but that was against the Bucks and the Ravens. Okay. Those, those are tough running, running matchups. Etienne, he's running back five on the season in full PPR leagues. Running back five. He's top seven at the running back position in carries, rushing touchdowns. Receptions, receiving yards, and targets. Top seven at all those. The Jaguars, that line's moving right now. I believe it's at four points. They're four-point home favorites. Carolina, the Panthers, they're 29th against running backs. Fantasy points allowed. My buddy, Mr. Tuddy, I wouldn't be shocked oh. here if Travis Etienne got in twice. I'm in the Queef Bowl matchup in our fucking league. Travis Etienne, I'm calling on you, man. I'm calling on you at home against the Panthers. Please score. My buddy, Mr. Tutty, give me two. Give me two. It's Christmas. I didn't get much. I didn't get much for Christmas this year. Give me two Tutties, Etienne. Please. Please. Hey, that's a solid pick. Uh, your extra juicy reindeer at the uh, running back position there, Travis Etienne. Look, he's a smash play against the Panthers. Um, with a backup quarterback, you're going to lean on the run game. Uh, I like the call there, Matt. Um, go ahead and jump right into wide receivers here. Uh, staying with the home team, the uh, revenge of the Queefs. Uh, at the wide receiver position, my extra juicy Dow is none other than Mike Evans. I remember. Ooh, remember good pick. Mike good Evans, pick. boys. Mike Evans, the dude has been balling. He's been on a tear in the last seven weeks. He has scored touchdowns in six games. Six out of seven, the dude has a touchdown. Uh, and in two of those games, he has two touchdowns. Wow. Uh, the connection with Baker is real. It's well documented that Baker Mayfield likes to throw the ball down the field. It's a match made in heaven when he came to Tampa Bay and linked up with Mike Evans because Mike Evans is a deep ball threat at all times. Um, and I got to say, Mike Evans kind of falls under this category of old guys balling. I mean, look at our guy Joe Flacco putting up damn near 30 fantasy points uh, just last night. 
So yeah. Mike Evans is no stranger to the league. He's been doing it at a high level for a long time, and it's no exception this year. Top five wide receiver uh, on the year. It's a divisional game. I said it earlier. It's time for Tampa Bay to quit messing around, put some respect on the NFC South, win out, and make the playoffs with a decent record, smack the, smack the Saints, and uh, go take it. Mike Evans, my buddy, Ooh. Mr. Tutty. He might get two. I, was I would love for him to get two because I'm, I'm trying to win a championship. I was wondering. I was wondering. Mike Evans, a hell of a pick this year. He was a guy that I was out on. Not not necessarily because of him, but more because of Baker Makeweef. But Baker, he's had a solid season too. Tampa looking like they're gonna be uh division winners if they can if they can win out. My extra juicy dog at the wide receiver position for week 17. Gonna be a guy we we've talked about plenty on here, but I had to fire him up again here. C D Lamb. C D Lamb in that extra juicy game on Saturday night against Detroit. I had to get a piece of this game in this segment. That 51 and a half point over under, that's easily the highest on the week. C.D. Lamb, he's wide receiver two in full PPR leagues on the season. He leads the NFL with 109 receptions. His 1,424 receiving yards is second in the NFL. Dallas, they're five and a half point home favorites against the Lions. Detroit is 27th against the wide receiver in fantasy points allowed. C.D. Lamb, he's going to catch his 10th touchdown on the season, double digits. My buddy, Mr. Tutty. C.D. Lamb on Saturday night, baby. Going to get double digits, t- double digit tutties on the year against the Lions. C.D. Lamb, he's probably a keeper in your league if you got a, if you got a couple keeper league. I, I like C.D. Lamb. We got a pair of greedy boys on the podcast tonight. Back to Hell back. Yeah. Hell yeah. Hey, uh... I love the pick, CeeDee Lamb. The, him and Dak have been doing it at a high level the last several weeks. It's a it's a great connection. The offense has been prolific. Um, that's a smash play. And, and in a really exciting game on Saturday night. Finally, moving into the tight ends, my extra juicy dog at the tight end position, again, on my team, it's going to be Dallas Goosterk. Goosterk. But hopefully no gooses this weekend. Um, yeah, snagged him up off the waiver wire. I don't know. Somebody dropped him when he was on injured reserve. Really? Didn't have a spot for him. Yeah, had some other tight ends on her team. So, yeah, picked him up, and it's been okay. And then this last game gave me double digits. So, yeah, he's been healthy since coming back. Um, he's had nine targets the past two games. Uh, Jalen Hurts is definitely looking his way. Eagles has have struggled as of late, but they're still – a top tier offense. Um, and so he's going to, he's going to get, he's going to get his um, Jalen Hurts also has looked at him in the end zone. He did throw the ball to him in the end zone last week. Didn't make that connection. Um, but I like for them to make that connection. This oh, week. <laughs> so I'm doing it again. Back to back weeks. I'm going to go wow. triple my buddy, Mr. Tutty. Wow. Jalen Hurts going to be looking for the big guy in the end zone. Dallas Goddard, my buddy, Mr. Tutty. He's going to find it and I'm going to win the fantasy championship. <laughs> Dallas Goddard, baby. Good, good pick. He's annually a top 10 tight end since Zach Hurts left town. I like Gooster. I like Gooster. Hopefully, hopefully he doesn't goose you though. Hopefully he doesn't goose you. <laughs> My extra juicy dog at the tight end position for week 17. First time I've talked about this guy all season in this segment. You know, it's kind of, I kind of felt like it was cheating bringing him up, but it's, it's really not cheating anymore. I got Travis Kelsey. He's playing the Bengals. He's tight end two on the season, full PPR leagues. He's going to pass TJ Hawkinson this, this week. TJ's number one. Travis Kelsey 10 has a 10.8 yards per reception. That would be a career low for him. He only has five touchdowns this year. He's failed to reach six touchdowns in a season only once since 2016. Kelsey's tight end nine in a on a points per game basis over the last six weeks. So he he's not he's not trending in the right direction. The nine and six Chiefs, yes, the nine and six Chiefs. They lost to the Raiders on Christmas. Got a quote from Travis Kelsey after that loss. Quote. Right now, I'm not playing my best football, and I got to fucking lock the fuck in and be more accountable for my teammates, end quote. 
Chiefs, they're six and a half point home favorites, 43 and a half point over under in this one. The Bengals are 31st against the tight end position in fantasy points per game allowed, second to last. Travis Kelsey, you heard the quote. He wants to be better. Him and Patty are going to be clicking. Andy Reid, he's going to be scheming things up. Travis Kelsey, my buddy, Mr. <laughs> Tutty. Triple guarantee, just like you here, Sammy. Travis Kelsey going to find the end zone against the Bengals on Sunday afternoon. Well, Sammy, that's going to do us for this week on the Don't Tell Mama Sports Podcast. Hell of an episode this week. As always, appreciate you stepping in for our guy, Maxwell, enjoying that family time up north in Indiana. We, we Sports sports are, are riding right now, as they always are, at the end of the season, at the end of the year, calendar year. College basketball, getting into getting into our conference play now. We got the bowl games going. We saw Notre Dame this afternoon in the Tony the Tiger Sun Bowl in El Paso, Texas, had the largest bowl win in school history. Did you catch any of that game over the Beavs of Oregon State? Did you catch any of that? I saw some highlights. 40 to 8, Sam. The Beavs scored with a couple minutes to go to save from a goose. Damn it, I would have been calling calling the Oregon State gooses next year if they got goosed in this game, but they scored with a couple minutes remaining to make it 40 to 8. Ass beaten for Notre Dame. College bowl games, they're still riding. They're riding tonight, riding tomorrow. Of course, the playoff on Monday. Hell of a time to be a sports fan. Thank you, everybody, for your support, for your love, for your comments, your likes. Please tell your friends about the Don't Tell Mama Sports Podcast. Sam, what do you got for the people before we get out of here, man? Yeah, I just want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Um, appreciate you, as always, having me on. Happy to fill in for Max. Um, I know Max is going to be listening, so you know I got to do my best impression of him and, and just tell everybody to like, comment, and subscribe to the Don't Tell Mama Sports Podcast. If you want sports, if you want what everybody talks about, and what hardly anybody talks about, they've got it all here on the Don't Tell Mama Sports Podcast. So come out, watch some shorts, stay with us for an hour, watch the whole podcast. It's it's good stuff, good breakdowns, uh, good fantasy talk. So it's all here. Um, yeah, go Colts. And uh, I got some tough decisions to make with my fantasy team. I could make league history in just my five years being in it and go from worst to first. It's never been done. I'm up to the task. It's a tough game against Zach. He's got a hell of a team. I got to get in the lab and make these make these decisions about who I'm going to start. A thousand dollars for first place, Sam. That that's a good chunk of change to be playing a little fantasy football, man. A bit, that's a I'm good. I'm seeing dollar signs. I'm seeing dollar signs. Like I said earlier, if you're in the Denver, Colorado area, hit us up. We're going to be on the south side of the stadium tailgating on Sunday for this Chargers game. It's going to be a snooze fest, but damn it, we're going to have a good time with it. Sammy, happy new year. Happy new year to everybody out there. And lastly, damn it, don't tell your mama. <laughs>